Welcome to Revenue Talks, the show where we get real about what it takes to build pipeline and drive expansion as a go-to-market team. I'm Justin Keller, the Vice President of Revenue Marketing at Drift, and on this show, I'm here talking to folks across the entire go-to-market organization, which means marketing, sales, and customer success, about how they use conversations, technology, and cross-functional alignment to build more pipeline and drive expansion. Because revenue, it's everyone's business now. Hey, everybody. It's Justin. Happy second day of 2023, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Revenue Talks. And this one is really special to me because of all the amazing guests we've had on Revenue Talks. I've never chatted with someone that I've known for over a decade now. Um, So I want to kick the year off with the self-proclaimed revenue therapist and extensively experienced sales and marketing leader, my former boss, my current friend, Neil Cohen. Um, Neil and I worked together in a past life, and since then, Neil's gone on to create his own agency where he's helping both large and small businesses find their focus and scale it into an executable marketing and sales program. So today, we're going to get Neil's unfiltered thoughts, and spoiler alert, there's not a lot of filter on Neil. Um, So we're talking (laughs) about what it takes to align marketing and sales teams and how to create consistent messaging at scale. I'm sure we're going to have some hot takes and some, some wild bloopers in this, and I cannot wait. Let's get into it. Neil, welcome to Revenue Talks. Uh, hello, Justin. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited to have a conversation with you today. Um, just it, not only because of our history, but um, for those listening, I pretty much everything I know I've learned from Neil. So um, oh. you're gonna you're gonna hear it from the source. But Neil, this this podcast talks a lot about ultimately sales, um, marketing, CS, customer facing alignment, mm-hmm. and that has been fodder for now two full seasons and we still haven't cracked the nuts. So let's cut to it. Maybe you got the answer for us. We can, we can quit this podcast. What do you think is at the heart of sales and marketing misalignment? Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, the, the age old question, I think they were talking about this, uh, uh, BC and by the way, BC is not before COVID. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, and so, you know, this is uh, obviously the age old uh, debate that's been going on for, uh, decades. I, I think when you look at sales and marketing, um, you know, they're fundamentally different people. And I think a lot of your listeners will already know this, um, uh, and uh, that's why marketing people are in marketing, and that's why sales people are in sales people uh, are in sales. You know, it, they fundamentally solve problems differently. If you gave the same problem to a sales team uh, and to a marketing team, they would go about solving that problem uh, very differently. Specifically, let's say, um, uh, because this has never happened to any of your listeners, that the CEO comes in, hey, we need to get a 10% boost in the fourth quarter. How do we get to it? And so the marketing people with all the current marketing tools and analytics and things that they know will do the math. And they say, well, to to go through the conversion funnel and all the things that we need to do, we've got to get this this much more leads and this is what it will take well, to get them in and so on and so forth. So here's what we need to do. Uh, the sales leader will look at that problem and say, like, give me four more headcount. Yep. You know, and, 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 and fundamentally, they're both right. Um, but um, but the, the challenge is, is that those two answers aren't synchronized in a meaningful way. And um, and so, you know, why is there misalignment is because we think differently uh, and we act differently and somebody has to try to bridge that gap and make it all work together. So this makes me I've got a I've got a strong opinion on this, but I'm not going to leave the witness. This brings me (laughs) to the concept of like marketing, marketing and sales reporting into a CRO, into a chief revenue officer. Um, And do you think, what do you think about that? Like, do you think that having one person mediate or be responsible for both is the way to go? Or do you think that having that tension and that duality is an important part of, of a revenue team? I don't think those things are mutually exclusive, Justin. Um, uh, You can still have um, a good, heartfelt confrontation, because if everybody in the room thinks the same thing, then you've got too many people in the room. And so uh, to to have a give and take with sales is really important. Let's all remember, if you're in marketing, the salespeople are talking to the customers day in and day out, and they're just looking for a way in. 
think about that for a second. They're looking for a way in. They're looking for a toe in the door so they can start talking to that customer in a meaningful way and move them down the funnel. And so with marketing, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's easier, but, you know, you're working with messaging and going out there and do, and forward facing and all these things that you're doing with branded editorial and so on and so forth. You know, you, you know, your way in is different. You know, if somebody downloads something or looks at something or browses the website, that's a marketing victory. That is not a sales victory. <laughs> so so having that conflict uh, between them on what's going to get that toe in the door and move people down to actually a real conversation is something that that marketing people should look forward to happening um, and not something that should, should should they fight. You know, should there be one CRO over the whole thing? You know, I'm a big big fan of that kind of unity. And the reason why I'm a big fan of that kind of unity is because sales tends to freelance a lot uh, to get that toe in the door if they don't feel like marketing is helping them. So if you can't get that alignment at the very top level, you know, who are we? What are we talking about? What are the true value propositions? How do we sell this product? Because if you don't sell it well and you don't sell it right, you're only borrowing that customer. You're not getting that customer for a long-term thing. And so, you know, if you're not managing those expectations in the sales process and they buy something that they didn't think that they really wanted to buy, that does not help your company in the long haul. It might help your quarter but it doesn't help, you know, recurring revenue, especially if you're in a SaaS uh, business. Uh, so my answer is unified, but keep the tension. The tension is good, which is, I think, right? Like, I mean, any relationship. And that's why I love that you, you kind of count yourself as a revenue therapist, because <laughs> you do need that, that you need, to, you need both couples to sit on the couch together and right. hear each other out. Because at the end of the day, they both want the same thing. Marketing wants the same thing sales wants. It's just like, One's a little closer to it than the other. Both, you know. So what's what's so let's, let's just play that out, right? You get a sales leader and a marketing leader sitting down on the couch. What's the one thing you ask to crack that conversation open to get him to be, to be vulnerable and to, to start to come to agreement? Well, you know, this goes back, um, uh, and we've had this actual conversation before in another life. So um, this gets back to you know I'm an adjunct and I teach at San Francisco State University and you know, I put my uh, students in class projects together with people they don't know, and often there's um, a lot of headbutting and fighting in these groups because they're not you know they were not friends to begin with. They got thrown into this group. They've got the stress and pressure. And they all say like, God, you know, we're fighting in our group. So I, I say to the whole class, you know, when we broach this subject, okay, um, let's pause for a second. How many in this pe people in this class want to get an F on their group project for the semester? And by the way, this is like 40% of their grade. Well, nobody raises their hand. Who wants to get a D? Who wants to get a C? Who wants to get a B? Nobody raises Who wants to get an A? Everybody's hand goes up. Everybody wants to get an A. My comment to the class is, now you have understand your common ground, your, let's do air quotes, your opponent that you're arguing with here, even though they're in your group, wants to get an A. You want to get an A. You both have different ideas on how to get an A, but you're passionate about that because you want to win. That's a great place to start. Marketing wants to win. Sales wants to win. You all want to generate revenue. Why are you going to fight about how to get there if you understand that you're sharing the same goal and you start from what you can agree on, then you can kind of tend to move forward. And that's another reason why I like alignment from a CRO, which is, look, this is who we are and this is our value proposition. We are all in agreement with this. Sales and marketing, if you don't agree with this, then you're in the wrong boat. It's okay. That's fine. You probably need to go join another team. But remember, sales, you're joining us. Marketing, you're joining us. We're not joining you. We want your good ideas, but here's what we're all about. So join in or or you're, this is not the right place for you. And 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 that's that's something that a lot of sales and marketing leaders aren't willing to do. And I think, and maybe this takes us down another memory lane. I agree with everything you've said. Marketing is at the end of the day, for better or worse, don't let your salespeople hear this at the service of the sales team, right? We're here okay. to help them create revenue for the business, which then creates value for everybody else. But then marketers are also responsible for the squishy stuff, like the branding, the content, stuff that sales gets is important, right? Like, is like, yeah, that's part of marketing, but they don't necessarily see how that 
indirect value ultimately is going to benefit them, right? And you and I have gotten in sticky situations with this before where we're like, no, this is, you know, a long game. It's important that we play it right now because it'll pay off down the line. Um, but what can marketers do when they do get that, right? Like we're coming into, we just closed the fourth quarter. It may have been mm. a tight one for some. And when right. that happens, sales gets an unfair an extra heavy say in what marketing's up to, right? Because their their ass is on the line when it comes to closing down the year. Marketing is typically playing a longer game though, right? Like how do you keep that balance going? Well, you know, so marketers, and again, I'm coming at you a little bit here. Um, sales is a target audience and a persona and you're a marketer. So figure it out market to them, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I think this is some, an area where I've evolved, um, you know, all good marketers know that their, uh, core audiences have currencies of value. Um, a currency of value is something that's important to that audience that they really react to and, and, um, uh, you know, in a, a favorable way that's important to them. So when you're working with sales, Instead of dealing with currencies of your value, deal with currencies of their value, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay? And don't argue, you know, brand over, you know, transactions or that type of thing. Like, don't, why fight that battle? Do the things that you need, you need to do and focus with them on the things that they share that you both think are important and move them forward on that stuff. You know, and, and what can those things be? Like now everybody's saying like, well, what are those? Well, think of your sales team. All customers are different in all different organizations, right? So they're an internal customer. Um, uh, do you have all the branded editorial organized in a meaningful way so that they can rapidly access it and shift it out? Are you feeding them meaningful information so they can help close people that are already in the pipeline? In other words, if, you know, you know, you're out there saying, oh, we've got to do branding. I've got to get more leads in the funnel. But they're trying to just convert the people that they got. Their currency of value is turning that prospect into a paid customer. How do you mm -hmm. deal in their world and help them so they're going like, gosh, marketing is so helpful because they won't pay attention to the other stuff. We all know we have to do that. Why fight that battle? We know it has to be done. We know the research is there that says branded companies do better in demand gen and lead gen. We know that that's the fact. Okay. Don't. Fight that battle with them. It's all it's because that's not what they want to hear. It's not valuable to them. So focus on what salespeople think is valuable. That's the discussion you should be having. Yeah. Okay. So you just like this is why I love Neil everybody. Like he breaks things down into the simplest <laughs> format. I've said it on this podcast so many times in so many different ways. Look, you constantly you need to over communicate to sales every chance you get. You need to be everywhere they look. And Neil just said, look. Sales is a target audience for you. You're a marketer, market to them, right? And that's like, obviously, yes, right? And then that makes everything else true. You know, think about how many brand impressions it takes for, for you know, a brand to stick in someone's mind, how many emails it takes to get someone to take a meeting. That's exactly the same true. It's just internal. Like it's internal marketing with your sales team. And you're, yes. if you're a marketer and you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a pretty damn good marketer. Like use your skills for, for good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. I, I think... You know, look, everybody's in the heat of battle and they've got pressure on them to hit their own KPIs. But at the end of the day, the most important KPI is the revenue goals of the company, yep. you know, because you can eat your personal KPIs. You know, we've talked about this a lot. You know, nothing creates success like success. Yep. Uh, you know, um, yeah. but when it gets down, when things aren't going well and the finger pointing starts, you know, again, that's not a battle you want to engage in. The The thing you want to say is, you know something? Let's start pointing fingers. Tell me what's important to you right now so I can help you get to where you want to go. I'm listening. Let mm -hmm. me help you. And, you know, this gets back to, you know, the old Jerry uh, McGuire, like, you know, help me help you, yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, instead of arguing and fighting. And, you know, and again, and this, this gets back to, you know, the, the essence of, of process and things like that. I'm going to take a step back. Every company has a process, like here's our funnel and here's our metrics and here's how we go to sales and here's how sales go. 
And and the thing is, is that we stick so close to these things. And and as you and I have both found out, is funny thing about customers, their process is in our process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in talking to sales, you know, it's like, how can we help you solve your customer's problem? You know, yeah. if we solve the customer's problem, we'll solve your sales problem. If you're trying to solve the sales problem, you're never going to win. And that's like, that's, then you're on the road to being aligned, right? Like you're not, you share the same goal, but now you're sharing the same problems. Now, how do we crack that open? How do we, marketing has strong opinions as they should, um, but how do they work with sales in a way where they can synthesize sales is very strong and multi multiple opinions about things in a way where, you know, the marketer is responsible for it at the end of the day, they need to do what's right. But getting that input from sales is of the utmost importance. So they feel heard. How do you, how do you, how do you strike the balance there? Like how do you intake a salesperson's or sales, more likely a sales team's breadth of opinions and merge that with what you and your market research and your understanding of the, the category and the brand needs mm -hmm. to be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, again, there's, there's a couple of things that are going on here. You have all this data. They have all this anecdotal evidence of what's working for them and what's not working with them. And two things can equally be true, but in conflict with each other. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and we have to realize that when we go into these conversations, it's not a zero sum game. Yep. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, my challenge to your marketers out there is, again, if you're looking at sales as a customer, you know, if you were going out and doing empathetic interviews and, uh, you know, in-depth interviews with your customers, you know, what's what's you remember the five whys. You're always asking, why is that important to you? Why is that important? You explain that to me. Let me understand it. And I would probably challenge all your marketers out there that you never ask why they feel that way. Mm -hmm. You just have a fight. And so you know, this gets back to what you're saying. So when you get into those conversations about where we need to go and what we need to do, and you have all this data, and they say something that's in conflict with the data, how deeply do you try to understand where they're coming from versus argue with them over what they're saying? And that's why I'm saying, I'm saying two things can be true at the same time, but be in conflict. So the information and anecdotal evidence that they're giving to you can be 100% true and could be things that are in the way of getting them to close a sale or in their mind, getting them to close a sale. You have to understand it and get on the page with them. So shared definitions. When you say that word, does that word, what is it from Princess Bride? I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> you know, so, you know, sharing definitions, sharing understanding. Well, why are you getting a roadblock there? How come that piece of content isn't working for you? I tend to call it branded editorial, but how come that's not working for you? Why are you getting pushback for you? How, you know, I gave you all this stuff. You're not using it. Oh, it's, you know, baloney. Well, why is it baloney? Tell me why. Help me understand why you can't use that. Um, and then they tell you why. You say, well, explain that to me more. You know, do you think the customer could use this or not? How come you don't want this tool? If I were to give you a better tool, what would that tool be? Why do you think that would work? Okay, let's do an experiment. Let me take my data and your insight and let's merge that together and see if we get a better answer. Because at the end of the day, if they're not using this stuff, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. Yeah, exactly. And that's that brings me to... a. Another question is like, okay, great. Your feedback is valid. We've taken it. It's part of the messaging framework or whatever it is, right? Whatever. And by the way, I love like, well, maybe we should get into some nihilisms in a minute, Neil, because I, I do one of the things I love is like, rather than content, it's branded editorial. That makes your, your marketing content sound so much more expensive and better and valuable. So that's a good right. tip for everyone listening. Branded okay, editorial. Let's not stop there for it. If you say content marketing, look up the definition of the word content. It's content is a commodity. So when you say content marketing, you're literally, literally, and I'm not saying literally as figuratively as people say it today, like they say my, yeah. my head literally exploded, right? <laughs> okay, can't happen. Okay, uh, but it is literally saying commodity marketing. If you say yeah. content marketing, you are literally saying commodity marketing. Yeah. And so when you say branded editorial, Again, our little aside here, what you're saying is that what you're putting out there in the marketplace is a editorial perspective and point of view based on the fact that your company has probably put a $100 million marker down 
on this is an important product to go in this direction in the marketplace that's white space that differentiates us. That means that you've got skin in the game and you should have a share of voice. How you use that share of voice is important. And so having a point of view that pushes the edge and is written more from like a journalistic perspective about the space is much more interesting. And then again, this gets back to the challenger sale. You know, a good salesperson and a good marketing person is challenging the customer to understand the category better, yep. to choose you because they better understand where things are going. If you are in a place where you're selling price, you are not selling value and branded editorial can help create value. A hundred percent. I remember, I don't know if you remember this. I remember you were putting together a press release and you wrote it like, the article that would have been written based on the press release and everyone's heads literally exploded. <laughs> it was like, everyone's like, but you can't do this. Right. Like, but it's like, why not? You just cut right to the chase. Like this is the article. Like they may as well copy paste this. Yes. And right. I was like, obviously, yes, that's the way it should be done. This whatever formality and PR and press releases is for the birds. Yeah. Well, right. here's a free one for your, um, again, all you marketers out there. If you are drafting press releases, um, and the first quote starts off with, we're excited, you have failed. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you're excited. You took the time to write a press release and spend $1,200 to put it out on Business Wire. Yes, you're <laughs> excited. We understand that. <laughs> but everything in a news release should have something uh, that is dialed into a strategic goal uh, uh, for the company, uh, it should be of strategic importance. It should be making a key point about the value of your company or the value of your services or the value of what's happening, um, and should be additive to the marketing and sales process. Um, uh, saying we're excited does none of those things. Yeah. I hundred percent agree. Okay. So, um, so go ahead. great as a little aside, branded editorial, um, we're very excited about it. <laughs> if you start calling it branded editorial, people's heads may literally explode. <laughs> um, okay, so we've we'll get back on track here. We were talking about getting sales and marketing kind of on the same page with messaging, synthesizing feedback, making it one unified message. That then requires us to go back to the sales, the broader sales organization, enable them, educate them on it, and. That's a tricky thing to do, right? You spend all this work. And then to your point earlier, like all, all a salesperson wants to do is get a toe in the door. But at the same time, to scale properly, they need to be singing from the same songbook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What what tips do you have on that? And this is, I'm interested, like like sub question, sub, sub bullet on this question. Do you ever have to take your marketing hat off and put your sales hat on? Like do you mm -hmm. switch, do you do any mode switching or is ultimately it all come from one place when you're leading both the sales and a marketing team. Well, I'll give you an example of something I'm working on. And for your guests out there, I'm an independent consultant work with a lot of companies. I'm working with a company right now that's trying to improve their um, message um, in sales uh, uh, to their customers. And, you know, right from the get go, we, you know, like, you know, when I go in and try to help a company, we do internal stakeholder interviews. Well, um, of all the internal stakeholders, I think I talked to six internal stakeholders and four of them were in sales <laughs> and really trying to understand mm -hmm. them and what they're going through. And then I talk to their customers. And then when I'm done, I bring the stakeholders together. I said, here's what I learned from stakeholders. Do you agree with all this? Is the challenges and problems? Great. Mm -hmm. Here's what I learned from your customers. And 100% of the time when you're doing these empathetic interviews with customers, you will learn all kinds of stuff that your salespeople don't know because a lot of them are so busy selling, they don't listen. You know, they're not very, even though they know challenger sales, they're not very good at challenger sales. And so when you start working them into the process and they're there from the get-go and you don't, you know, it, it, a lot of time marketing, it's ta-da, Right. Hi, sales. Ta-da. <laughs> here's your new deck and here's your new messaging. And they're just looking at this and going like, this is shit. You know, <laughs> like, I don't agree with any of this. Where did this come from? Because they weren't part of the process. So, you know, my, you know, biggest challenge to marketers out there is that sales has to be part of it. And it's not so much that they have to agree with every single thing that you do as much as that if they're along for the ride and they participate, they're less apt to critique it and trounce it and will help you make it work. 
you know, so what we learned, for example, you know, in presenting, let's say, to this recent customer that I just talked to you about, my customer, I presented the salespeople were on the, the final presentation of how we thought the message can go and what's your feedback. And all of them said, like, that's on point. That's on point. You know, tell me about this. Explain this to me. And I explained, oh, yeah, I agree with that, all this kind of stuff. So now I've got their four key sales leader completely 100 percent on board because they were there through the whole process. They saw themselves in the answers. And I included them when the surprises came in from their customers and I talked them through it. I go, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Right? So now they're bought in. Once they bought in, now how do I enable them to use the thing that they bought into in a meaningful way? And one of the things I'm working on right now is a sales script. So I'm drafting a challenger sales script so they can start talking to their customers a little bit differently than they're talking to them right now. Nothing different about the product and services. It's just, what's the entry point? What's in the psychographic of the customer that they didn't really understand what was going on? What's the support? I pulled together, you know, about 15 pieces of deep research that were just happened to be out there in the web on their category. The web's a wonderful thing. And I created a folder of all of this stuff. I said, like, look at all this powerful research that you can use to help close a customer. And it's all from, you know, within the last year. So yeah. all enabling to help them sell this idea through, but yet they participated in that idea. So they feel that they have ownership in it. I feel like we're hitting on a huge, huge topic. This is probably going to have to be another conversation we pick up in the next season of the podcast. But like, there's so much, you've said so many things that are like the art of jujitsu of getting smart sales to pull in the same direction, right? Like, you know, like marketing to them, like they're a target audience, like getting them by and use their own words against them, almost not against them, but you know, use, but use no, their own exactly words right. to your yeah. benefit. Well, again, let's get back to the original place where we started this conversation. Why are marketing and sales always at odds? Because they create that dynamic because they argue and they fight instead of you want to get an A, I want to get an A, yep. you have some interesting insights, I have some interesting insights. How can we have those things work together? Because all these things are true. Yep. And that's, exactly. I think, the challenge that the marketer has is because sales comes to him and says this, 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 and you go like, well, but, you know, no, but. Get that out of your count. You know, get that word out of your vocabulary because whenever you use the word but, it means that everything that came before was irrelevant. Yeah. And 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 it and it gives it short shrift and it doesn't give it the credence that it deserves. You know, if you listen to your salespeople deeply, you will learn a lot. Um, you know, sit in on the sales calls. Uh uh, you know, and 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 understand, like sit behind them and watch their activity. You yeah. know, and and understand, you know, when you walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, you get a better idea. You know, they're not going to do it with you, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it with them. Yep. 100% agree. Cannot recommend enough to, and I was just, just, just came from a sales call before I joined you here, Neil. And I'm like, wow, like at the end of the day, we talk about all the same numbers all the time, week in, week out. But then when it gets to end of the quarter and we're going through pipeline review, it's just like, wow, these guys live in a wildly different world than I do. And it's yeah. a good reminder. Yeah. Well, you know, um, instead, of, instead of saying like, that's bullshit and saying like, tell me why that's not working for you. Yeah. Help me understand. You know what? We don't have to have that meeting right now, but I'm going to set up 90 minutes tomorrow and we're going to go through it and we're going to talk through why that's not working for you and why some of these things, why you don't think it's working for you. <laughs> Neil is a font of some of the most wonderful aphorisms in business, but in general um, that I've ever heard. One of my favorites, and I still use to this day is... Um, and this is very applicable to marketing and to branded editorial is if you're trying to explain something, it's like asking someone, you know, if I ask you what time it is, tell me, I'm, I'm screwing this up. Tell me, say this for me correctly. Well, no, well, it's, it's, it's pretty <laughs> simple. It, well, well, look, how many times do people ask you what your company does and you, you describe the company by the features and here's what we do, here's what we do, but not the why people should care. So, you know, if I yeah. ask you, what does your company do? Like, don't, when I ask you what time it is, don't describe how the watch works. Exactly. And that's what most people do. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like all of these things kind of came up, you know, like I've been doing this for, uh, um, you know, 40 plus years and you just hear things all the time and it just sticks in your head. And, uh, 
And, you know, it's so funny. It's like, you know, you know, song lyrics or movie quotes. There's one for every situation. Um, yep. So you can kind of, you know, you kind of, you know, it's just all about timing. Here's one for your marketers, because I think they'll all appreciate this. And, uh, you know, I, there's there's some entomology to this one. Uh, many, many years ago, I was working with uh, a client that was making uh, direct methanol fuel cells. And everybody out there is now rolling their eyes or sleeping. Uh, but they were tiny, tiny little batteries that you would use instead of recharging, you know, and you could put them in a cell phone. This was an idea back, you know, because charging was a big thing like 30 years ago. Um, and so or actually 20 years ago. Um, and I was talking to one of the engineers and I said, like, well, what are you doing right now? He says, well, right now, uh, they are three moving parts in the, um, in this little tiny battery. And my goal is to reduce it down. I go like, but there's only three moving parts. <laughs> like, how can you reduce it down? Like, how can you engineer that out of a thing so tiny to make it do the things that you need to do? And he says, well, it's really important because, um, uh, because, the the parts that are not there are the ones that don't fail. Hmm. So I thought about that for a little bit. And I said, like, marketing's like that a little bit. I go like, you know, and I started thinking it through. It's like the most effective part of your marketing is the stuff that you don't do. Hmm. Bank drop we're, moment. We're always trying to do so much. It's like, how much can we do versus focusing on something and doing it super well. So we've had this part, and I'll give you one more when we get back to branded, branded editorial and outbound marketing, when you're going to try out there and try to, you know, do webinars and events or speaking, or, you know, you have your people speaking at conferences or, <clears throat> or you're doing a white paper or blog post. You know, so we talked about this a long time ago. I'm a big believer in doing one big, meaningful thing. So, for example, let's go out and spend 40 grand on a meaty piece of research. And notice I use the term meaty because meaty, yep. my perspective is use every part of the cow. So what's yep. use every part of the cow? What can you do with that research over six months? So instead of trying to do 50 different marketing things, use that research as a tent pole for your next, you know, seven or eight blog posts. Sure, you release the whole report and you can get it and there's a top line, but nobody's going to remember the whole thing. So yeah. dissect that thing and use it over time. Like have a story to tell over time. Um, uh, make a webinar out of it or two or three webinars out of it um, and do it in a meaningful way that you can engage your customers and bring them in to that so they can be part of the webinar. So it's customers talking to customers. Um, uh, uh, do the white paper on the research. Use that as a touchstone for your speaking engagements for your executives. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a number of news releases that you could do from it where you can lift stuff out of it and make it meaningful out there for the uh, for the general public. And tell so, people but, how but, excited about it. Well, Right. Well, yeah. Tell people how excited. But the point is, is that in a typical marketing organization, they do the research, they send out the release, and then they're on to the next thing. And what I'm trying to tell you is invest big in big ideas and make those 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 ideas work over time before you move to the next idea. Because if it's big enough and it's powerful enough, you got to give it time to take hold. It's like watching, um, I, I always use kind of Netflix, like a, something you might binge. It's like, you, could you imagine the Queen's Gambit in, a, in you know all nine episodes in two hours? You wouldn't know what the hell was going on. That's what you're trying to do in marketing all the time. You're trying to pack all this crap, 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. It doesn't work. Okay. Yep. So, you know, you've got to stretch that story over time. You're starting people from a point where they don't know something because you want to tell them something they don't know. And you want to move them over to a place where they do, they, they learn something new and they inculcate it into their head and their life and everything that they're doing. It doesn't, it's not one and done. We all know this, right? So, so take that piece, make it big, make it strong, and leverage it for three to six months. 100%. Um, okay. okay, Neil, we are at the end I'm here. So we always, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm excited to be <laughs> I'm so excited. This is why I just like, yes, I knew, like, I mean, anytime we talk, one or both of us get so fired up, and that's one of the things I love, and I'm so excited to have yeah, you yeah. on. It's the, going the out podcast. my news release on this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so we have a signature uh, revenue talks question. Oh, um, and we are, uh, this is the very beginning of 2023. Oh. What, in your opinion, is the number one thing that go to market teams should be focused on to accelerate revenue for their business in this new year? I think that every good marketer, as you go into 2023, should kind of look at a bit of a reset. And when I say reset, don't assume that everything you've learned from your customers over the last couple of years is still relevant going into 2023. We have a very dynamic environment in the world right now. And what was reality three months ago is not even reality today. I would strongly recommend everybody to take a fresh look uh, before they start really going hell bent into the year and, 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 and go out and talk to their customers again and see what's going on and take a pulse and understand if the problems that they were solving six months ago are the problems that they're trying to solve today as it relates to your product and services. I think that would do you and your organization a lot of justice. Everybody, Neil Cohen, one of the world's greatest marketers, one of the world's greatest humans. Thank you so much for joining me, Neil. You're too kind, Justin. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening to Revenue Talks. If you liked this episode, please consider leaving a review wherever you're listening. You can connect with me on Twitter at Justin Keller and the entire Drift Podcast Network at, at Drift Podcast. Remember, Revenue, it's everyone's business now. Thank you.